You are in for an interesting ride. Welcome to another Amash Project Archives. And in this episode, still with the Amash in America series, we're going to meet Bob Brown. Bob Brown is one of those wonderful entrepreneurial types who in 1991 set up the International UFO Congress. It's been in a couple of places or three perhaps. I know it's been in Nevada in Lochlin and then in Arizona. And it was a wonderful opportunity to catch up with him for about half an hour and have a chat. And what came out of that chat was something very interesting because I have a great interest in Billy Meyer and so does he. So enjoy Bob Brown, who is a wonderfully amiable person who has done an incredible job and what a fantastic legacy he has left us with that fabulous icon of all conferences, the International UFO Congress. Thanks, Bob. Enjoy, everybody. Hello, and welcome to AMASH in America. We're here at the 22nd International UFO Conference, and this is taking place in Arizona. And we're here now with Bob Brown, and Bob Brown was the founder of this fantastic, iconic conference, and he's come all the way to Arizona to be here, see the conference, and to tell us a little bit about what inspired him. Bob, welcome. Well, thank you. Can you tell us what first got you started on this road of creating this fantastic conference? Well, uh, yeah, we probably have to go back uh, to my childhood, <laughs> where it all began. I'm, I'm, I'm jesting a little bit there. Um, let me correct one little thing you said there. Okay. Um, I am the founder, but there were two of us that founded the International <laughs> UFO Congress. Wendell Stevens. Oh, the wonderful, late, great. Wendell yes, Stevens. and myself founded the event. Now, after the first four years, Wendell said, Bob, I can't afford to lose any more money. Okay, I will continue to help you till my dying day, but I cannot lose another penny. So if it's going to continue, it's going to be on your shoulders. Okay, so um, Wendell continued to be my partner and my mentor and my best friend in the world throughout yeah. all of it. But um, from that point forward, uh, Financially, it was on my shoulders to continue it. Well, you've done an amazing job. What was it about this field that got you involved? Have, have you had experiences yourself? I have seen things, yes, of course. And um, look, this idea, this idea that there could be something else out there, there could be somebody stopping by and tapping us on the shoulder and saying, hello, we're here, okay? There's nothing more fantastic and incredible in life. I think it's the most important thing It to is the most important thing. There is nothing, everything else pales in importance to the fact, I said fact, that we are not alone in the universe. Here's a question I pose to people, okay? Most, do you agree that the universe is infinite? Most people will say, well, yeah, the farther out our scientists look, uh, we're looking out there uh, gazillions of light years now, the farther we look, we find more, more existence, more creation. What is the possible reason of creating an infinite universe? For me, it's a simple answer. There's only one possible reason, infinite life. It's everywhere. So what was the driving force then behind the setting up of the conference? Was there something to do with Wendell's experiences? No, not, not directly in any way. 
I had the strangest event ever happen to me, ever in my life. We have to go back about 20, I don't know, 26, 27 years ago. Forgive me, it's a, it's, I, it's a while back, I can't keep it exact. Somewhere around that time frame. Back then, I was mostly in the film business. And I would go to the Cannes Film Festival, the MIPCON actually, um, every year. Uh, buying and selling films. So we're around the 80s, are we in this, at this time, a bit uh, earlier? Yeah, let me see. What, whatever 26 or 7 years yeah. ago would be, okay. yes, that would put us about there. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm at the Palais. The second day of the, of the festival, they have a giant party at the Palais, which is on the other side of, uh, of the bay. And it's, it's a giant uh, set of buildings, pavilion buildings with terraces connected. And there's 6,000 people from, from the convention that are here to play at this party. And I'm walking through the crowd with a friend of mine. And we're talking film business, of course, what else? And as I'm walking through the crowd, a woman works her way across our path. And as my eyes fall on her and she's going across our path, a voice talked in my head. Now, not exactly like you and I are talking now, not exactly like that, but clearly and distinctly, a voice talked in my head, and it's the first and only time this has ever happened to me, and um, I guess I'm easy because it changed me fundamentally when this occurred. I mean, was this, can I just ask you about the voice? Oh, did, yes. Did it have a gender to it? Was it uh, no. familiar? It was genderless, but what it said was a very simple statement. You must talk to this woman. You must talk to this woman. It repeated and repeated and repeated. And so we walked across the terrace, we, we reached the next pavilion building, and I said goodbyes to my friend. He realized I wasn't there anymore, and I wasn't. And because this is going off in my head, and I'm panicking, I'm freaking out. I didn't really, I didn't know what was going on. And so the next thing I remember, I'm gulping a liquor drink there's bars all over and I'm gulping a liquor drink and I'm walking in circles with this going off in my head and I said okay I'll talk to her and it stopped it was like somebody hit a light switch boom it stopped and so now I'm panicked because how am I gonna find her it's over 6,000 people party <laughs> and so okay I'll talk to her I gotta find her so I retrace my steps okay, I think it was about here where she crossed and I walked through the crowd, worked my way through the direction she was going. I got to the edge of the terrace, and there's, there's tables along the Mediterranean at the edge of the terrace. There's tables, and she's sitting there. This woman is actually sitting down, and she's talking to two men. And I said, oh, my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to? I can't just walk up to this woman and say, i got to talk to you. I don't know who she is. I have no idea who she is. Never seen her in my life. Quite a challenge, then. Quite a challenge. So I said, okay, I'm just going to ease my way up to them, and I'm just going to listen to what they're saying. So I do that. And lo and behold, they're talking about these young men's next film project, which, if they get the funding, is going to be a documentary on the 20th anniversary of the Concorde supersonic airliner. They want to do this documentary. And so, I, wow, I said, thank you so much. What an incredible way to be led to these guys, because these are the kind of people I'm here to meet, right? So I turn around. Geez, I couldn't help overhearing what you guys were talking about, <laughs> forgive me. Here's my card, I'm with World Aviation Video, and we really would love to talk to you about North American distribution of this film if you make it, okay? So we talk shop for 15 minutes or so, and these guys go on and take off, and now I'm left with this gal, right? Um, very personable, intelligent, nice-looking young lady, so we're talking, uh, you know, mostly shop, mm -hmm. we're hanging out, we, we have some hors d'oeuvres, we have some wines, and then we look at each other, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes later. Well, what do you want? Well, let's, you ready to go back? Yeah, I'm ready to go back. So we get on the bus, taking us back down to the Palais. And she's sitting, she's sitting next to the window and seat, and I'm sitting on the aisle seat. Now, I have to backtrack a little and give you some background. Before I left to con for that year, about three or four months before then, I had written, I read a book that was written by Gary Kinder, and it was called Light Years. And it was an update yeah. on, on the Pleiadian case, first uh, reported 
on in the United States by Wendell Stevens, okay? Now, in this book, he talked about what really happened with the case, about how the case was killed in the United States by APRO and uh, NICAP. And I was a member of both of those organizations. Can you just tell us what they are? Well, the they were the first um, nationwide organizations where people could give membership support and get information about what is going on in ufology. The summons, here, here's the bottom line of the story. Both of these organizations heard about the Billy Meyer case almost simultaneously, okay. within 24 hours of each other. And they both were organizations that were struggling to get membership, struggling to stay afloat financially to continue doing the work that they were doing in, in telling people on a monthly basis via their newsletters what was happening in the UFO field. Um, they contacted Billy Meyer, both organizations, and had extensive conversations with him about his case and what was happening. And can you just give us a, a couple of sentences about his case for those who, who won't know? Oh, okay. Billy Meyer was a one-armed Swiss uh, caretaker uh, slash farmer who um, was having regular ongoing contact with uh, ETs. And this contact was documented with visual sightings, uh, trace sightings, um, actual metals and uh, things that are left over, and the most amazing photo and motion picture uh, evidence we have to date. Yeah, I think that Wendell was involved in a lot of the analysis of the photographs as well, wasn't he? He, he was. Right? He was the prime mm -hmm. investigator yeah. from the United States that paid attention to the case and went over, dug into it, and people don't understand how incredible the case was. This case was so full of synergistic and virtually paranormal events that happened not just to Meyer throughout the whole thing. They extended to the people that got close to him. The, the stuff that happened with Wendell during his investigation would... I, the, Wendell didn't talk about it because he felt that it would take away from the mm. reality of the case itself because it was such high strangeness. I mean, virtually paranormal magic was going on around this entire case all the time. So it was an amazing case. To this day, I say it's still the best case that we have out there ever. So I read this book by Gary Kinder and he told about how these organizations killed the case in the United States by saying that it was all phony. And the reason that they said it was they Meyer agreed to have, have them over. His material was open to anyone that wanted to come and see it. They could investigate the sites, the photos, the motion film, the yeah. witnesses, the physical evidence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, he so was, was very cooperative, to, wasn't well, he? Very yeah. cooperative mm -hmm. to anyone who really wanted to know the truth of it. Yeah. And so they said, we'll be there next week. We'll have our representative there. First, we have to cable you our exclusivity agreement. And Meyer said, wait a minute. What exclusivity agreement? Oh, we can't afford to take our uh, limited resources and put them into the investigation of your case unless we have an exclusive on it. And Meyer said, no, no, absolutely not. What's happening here is a story for the world. It's not exclusive to anyone. So each organization independently came to exactly the same conclusion. We have to torpedo this case right. in case a competitive organization latches yeah. onto it and agrees to this and reports it. We have to torpedo it first. So it was this, it was this intense competition mm -hmm. and rivalry between these organizations that caused them to torpedo the Meyer case. They, again, they did it in the worst possible way, the way that most torpedoing is still done in the whole field today, and that is an investigator from their armchair, in their armchair, okay, proclaims, proclamation, oh, that's phony, that's all wrong, that's not real, those people are $3 bills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera still the way it's done today. Yeah. But to find out about 12 years later, right, that these organizations that I supported 
had done this. I was furious, okay, number one, but more importantly, number two, after reading the book, I realized that this, this is a real case, a real Indeed. case. Night and day on my mind, the biggest question in my mind, I would go to sleep with this question on my mind, I would wake up with this question on my mind, right? The Meyer case real. So in between the MIPCON and the MIFED, the Milan Film Festival, which follows it, there's a nine day window. And so I said, I will rent a car and I'll drive to Switzerland. I'll see if I can find this place called Schmidt Rudy. I'll see mm -hmm. if I can actually own investigation of it. And maybe with some luck, I'll even get to meet Meyer. So this was on my mind, I, consuming me, consuming me for three and a half, four months before going there. So now it's two days into the, into the conference and I'm left talking with this woman, right? So we're going back on the bus driving back uh, to the Palais. And so we're talking about what we're doing. And I said, hey, I'm showing a new uh, film uh, in three days in uh, such and such time in theater so-and-so. And it's a, in 70 millimeter. It's a documentary on the SR-71 Blackbird. And okay. she says, oh, I'd love to go see that film. She says, but I won't be here because I have to leave day after tomorrow. I have to meet my film crew and I'm going to do a story on whether the elephant is going to be declared an, an endangered species or not. And I, I'm going to meet the crew, and I, we, we're doing it from Switzerland, where they're making the announcement. So she I'm says, Switzerland. Switzerland, right? <laughs> what pops into my head? But what's been driving me crazy for four months? The truth of the Meyer case, right? So I said to her, never expecting an answer, really, you know, I said, well, that's in Switzerland. I said, does that name Edward Billy Meyer mean anything to you? Oh Let my God. It. She melted up against the window, melted up against the window, and she screamed at me, who the hell are you? How do you know Edward Billy Meyer? Are you NSA? Are you CIA? Are you... I, I, I mean, I, I was just overwhelmed. And so I, t I, I just was calm and I said, no, I said, I'm just, I'm who I told you I was. I, I do documentary films. I deal in them, I work in them, and I read this book, uh, Light Years, and I just uh, was thinking about trying to get to the, in my own mind, to the truth of this in between the two conventions. So she says, you really aren't NSA, <laughs> you, really, you, really <laughs> you really aren't Air Force Special Services, you aren't, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not any of those things, I'm who I am, I'm Bob Brown. And she said, okay, she says, we gotta talk. She says, can you come to my hotel with me? I says, well, yeah, I can. So I go to the hotel, she checks her messages and takes her 10 minutes and she comes down. She says, okay, I'm free. So we walk out to, along the Mediterranean, we find this little uh, all night bar cafe and we're sitting out there and we sit down and we commence to have this incredible talk about UFOs and about paranormal and um, about Edward Billy Meyer. Because it turns right. out that she herself had been there, not, you know, more than once. Oh, what, to meet to Shudmuti? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And so she herself had done all the things that I wanted to do, right? And she, she the, the only thing, the only bad thing from that meeting was that she did kind of convince me, discourage me from going on my own. She said, he'll be very happy to meet you and see you with you and talk with you, but you've got to write him first. You've got to tell him you're going to come. You've got to get like an invitation because if you just show up, it, it, it's not going to be good. Okay. And so I did let her convince me to do that part of it. But it turned out that short of meeting Wendell right then at that time, and I hadn't met Wendell yet. Okay. So in, short of meeting Wendell or Billy Meyer himself, she was probably the best person in the entire world that I could have met at that moment in time to talk about with the Billy Meyer yeah. case. Right? Prompted by your host. Yes. And so, uh, do you have any idea who this woman was? No, do you tell No idea? No. Okay. Her name was Linda Moulton Howe. Okay. Okay. She had just... Uh, just finished her first uh, big uh, coffee table book on uh, cattle mutilation at that time. So um, that was when I first met her. And so what I'm saying is that I'm easy because when I got back, I said, this is all just unbelievable, right? Remember, a voice talked in my head. 
Now, I don't know the last time you've had a voice talk in your head mm -hmm. Hasn't and, happened yet. and lead you exactly who you need to be led to mm -hmm. in the entire world at that moment of your life, okay? So, so I said, wow, I'm making documentary films, okay? Maybe I need to make a documentary film on the UFO phenomena. So that's what ended up happening. During the next year and a half, I spent a, a year crisscrossing the United States um, with, a, uh, with a partner, Ted Oliphant, and we made uh, a documentary called UFOs, A Need to Know. It was a feature length, uh, uh, finished out at 93 minutes, and uh, to this day, I think it's one of the greatest introductory kinds of things that's been done in the field. Um, and so all of that was due to this. Now, I said that we have started at the beginning when I was a kid. Well, look, from the time that I was a kid, I had interest in these subjects, okay? Um, and my interest, you know, waned and grew and waned, you know, throughout my life. But it was always there, and this just jump-started, kicked me in the ass, and it said, hey, you are supposed to be doing something, right? So in the process of making the documentary and in the process of crisscrossing the country, we went to all of the UFO conferences that there were to go to at that time. Right. Universally, all of them, my humble opinion, were being done, most of them for the wrong reasons, in the wrong way. And at the end of it all, I said, it can be done better. It can be done better. It can be done with respect for the person that's trying to come there and get information, yeah. which means that you don't do it as a dog and pony show. You don't have five speakers speaking in front of each other in five different lecture halls, right? Where you have to uh, get around. an ulcer trying yeah. to figure out who you want to hear, right? Um, you don't charge exorbitant prices because you're not doing this to make money, okay? You're doing this to give the presenters, the researchers, the speakers a a platform which is respectful yeah. and which is for them alone. When, when the curtain goes up and they're making their information available, that is whose information is being available yeah. at that time, not five other, six other people's, okay? Not what it was about. So we structured the International UFO Congress. First of all, it was designed to be a week-long event. People said, Bob, you're crazy you can't do a week-long event, right? Well, turns out you can. And so, um, long story short, I think that over the 20 years that we did the conferences, we did 24 conferences over 20 years, and I think that we've basically proved all the naysayers wrong. Yeah, I think you did. And I think you've left us a fantastic legacy, which is continued here with open minds, and uh, we can't thank you enough. <laughs> well, yes. It's been a great journey. And for those people that are getting ready to make the journey, um, it's, there's nothing else in your life that you can ever spend your time and your energy trying to get to the bottom of than the reality that we are not alone. And that is exactly what Bob Dean said, whom we've just spoken to as well, and I think it's the most important thing that humanity can focus on. Indeed it is. Bob Brown. Well, thank you for, thank you thank for you. Uh, spending some time. That's great, and thank you for that story. Absolutely fantastic, and thanks again for your wonderful contribution to this field and to all of our education. You're welcome. Thank you.